Blockchain Show is a podcast that demystifies cryptocurrencies and distributed ledger technology. Hello, welcome back. I'm Ethan Kinderconnect, and this is the Blockchain Show. It's my great pleasure to welcome Matthew Niemerg, PhD and the founder and president of Aleph Zero, a Swift nonprofit offering scalable plug and play privacy solution that leverages zero knowledge proofs or ZK snarks and secure multi party computation. Matthew, welcome to the Blockchain Show. Thanks, Ethan. A pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you very much for being here today. That threw me a little bit. Uh, Swiss nonprofit. Uh, feel free to uh, maybe introduce yourself a little bit more to the audience. I know it's your first time on the show, but if you'd like to give us any background about yourself and uh, how you came to Aleph Zero, that would be wonderful. Sure. Uh, yeah, let me maybe kind of give a, a preface with my, my background. So I did a, a some PhD work in in mathematics back in and back in 2014 is when I finished up. So I did my dissertation out at Colorado State University in in Fort Collins. After this, I had a postdoc at Berkeley with the Simons Institute. At the time, I was uh, you know just I, I knew about Bitcoin and and blockchain and, and all this, because if you were in grad school, or at least in, at least in the, the grad program that I was at, we, we all received the early cryptographic emails, um, you know, that were sent out to the community regarding this new technology called Bitcoin and, and kind of, you know, it was always put on everybody's radar. Now, at the time, this was, would have been in, you know, I think October of 2008 was whenever the, the e- emails were sent out through the cryptography email list. And, you know, you just, you know, this is like my first year in grad school. I'm like two months in, you know, I just started in August and you just don't have the time to kind of look into this. Right. But it's on your radar, you know, and, and at the time you just kind of think of it as a really interesting experiment, right. Um, where people are just you know, saying, Hey, we have a, a way of doing peer to peer value transfers. We're using game theory. We're using cryptography. And you're like, okay, well, that's that's cool, right? Um, but you know, fast forward a few years, and you really just didn't think that it would have, you know, sort of evolved in the way that it did, where there was a a large interest beyond the academic community uh, with the general public for this technology stack. So, so anyway, what what happened was that when I was getting ready to start my postdoc at a, at Berkeley. It was actually a joint position with um, uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing. So I was going to be out at uh, um, at Tsinghua in March of the next year. So this would have been in March of 2015. And I was going to be at this uh, this theoretical computer science institute that um, uh, Andrew Yao, uh, pro- you know, Professor Andrew Yao, who is actually the innovator of secure multi-party computation. He he solved the millionaire's problem and won this uh, the Turing Award for this back in the mid 80s. And so he was actually the the uh, the lead at this uh, this institute that I was going to be at. And you know one of the things that I had to do was was actually pay for my you know apartment complex on uh, my apartment on campus. And you know well because of the currency export laws of, of uh, the Chinese renminbi, you just don't have the ability of going to your local Wells Fargo or your, you know, Chase, you know, you know, whatever local bank here in the States. And you can't just get, you know, physical cash. Right. And at the time, this would have been, you know, in about October 2014 or so. At the time, everybody was, as far as the Bitcoin community was, you know, was concerned, was talking about how blockchain and Bitcoin could be used for to solve this global remittance problem. And I was sitting there thinking, okay, well, maybe I can go ahead and buy some some Bitcoin and send it to an exchanger in, in China who could go ahead and pay for my my apartment complex ahead of time, right? So before I would even get there, just you know, go ahead and and find somebody in the community and or somebody who was offering this this service, some business that was offering this some type of remittance solution, and uh, get them to go ahead and and pay. And it turns out that. After contacting a couple of these, uh, the some of these Chinese exchanges, and and everything, nobody actually offered a remittance service. 
which I thought was a little, you know, a little odd. So here you have this a bit of a disconnect between what the community was stating as far as a use case for this technology and what businesses were actually providing, you know, as far as the the type of product or service that they were willing to provide to consumers. And uh, this, uh, you know, by, but by then this would have been, you know, by the time that I, I learned that they weren't going to be offering the service, it didn't really matter. I'd already started buying Bitcoin on, I think Bitstamp was my first, uh, the first exchange that I used and, uh, you know, was basically trading on Poloniex back in the day and, uh, you know, just was, you know, just getting into it. And, and, that, and that's sort of like my, my initial foray into the, into blockchain. And so then during that entire time span, um, during my postdoc, postdoctorate years, I was just, you know, taking the time to look into the technology stack, um, kind of get my, you know, wrap my head around, you know, the different cryptographic solutions that were being used, um, how all these different components were put together to sort of give you this permissionless new emerging technology that that was Bitcoin. Yeah, wow, that's impressive. That's that's very early. I'm sure um, there were very few people actually buying Bitcoin back then. I mean, by, by by that time, most of the exchanges were pretty well established, right? So, I mean, Bitstamp was one, I think the first Bitcoin exchange, if I recall correctly. Um, I mean, you had things like BTC Instant or Instant BTC. I forget the actual, you know ordering for the, for that, that, that was run by, I think, Charlie Shrem. Um, but, uh, you know, like Bitstamp, I think is, I think they started in 2011, I want to say, um, but they're one of the earliest. And I think that I, I, you know, pretty, pretty soon Coinbase was just coming out at the time. Um, but most of the, the actual exchange in the markets were, were pretty well established by the time I was, I was coming in. Okay. So 2011 and you first, heard about it 2008 and i would imagine bef before then i mean i don't even know how people got bitcoin before the exchanges you pretty much had to know someone right you, you mined it i mean you just you know download the client and click the mining button or something right yeah that would have been a really good time to get <laughs> yeah. in. I, just... I i completely agree sometimes i wish i could go back in time and and uh be like all right well what what would have happened if I would have just you know ran some some computers in my <laughs> in the the sort of the penultimate my parents' basement or something while I was in college or, or what have you? Um, it would have been quite quite interesting. Yeah, well, I, I'm familiar with Berkeley, obviously, but uh, Simmons Berkeley is is that so? So the, the Simons Institute is a a is um, how how to how to put it is it it's a endowment that is was given by you know it's essentially funded by Jim Simons. So Jim Simons is the this um mathematician who went into um you know trading. Um he's the founder of Renaissance Technologies, so one of the largest hedge funds in the world. And they were doing a lot of this predictive analytics and machine learning models, you know, back in the 80s and early 90s before anybody else was was doing this. They have, I think, their medallion fund, for instance, is the is a fund that only their employees have access to. It's um, it, it's sort of a pretty you know, beats the market uh, fairly well consistently. Um, and sort of what has happened was that he's probably, I would say, Jim Simons is probably the largest or one of the largest private persons who donates to the to the sciences. And particularly in, in math and computer science. Very good. Is it on the same campus about? Yeah. So, so this would be, so what they did was uh, actually they, it's on the UC Berkeley campus. Um, I believe that the building um, used to be a biology building and it was, you, you could see some of these before and after pictures and it was sort of like dark and pretty dank and kind of just musty looking and they they completely renovated it. I think it was a sixty million dollar uh, endowment, if I recall correctly, um, it, or it may have been thirty million. I I forget the numbers precisely. Although you know, you might think that thirty million, sixty million, this is yeah the the order of magnitude is still roughly the same, right? 
Um, but, uh, you know, they, you know, so he donated quite, quite a bit of funds to, to start off the Institute and they just stripped out everything in this old, old building, um, completely retrofitted it, made it so that there is more of a open office space, um, on, on the different, there's three different levels. So the first level is where most of the conferences and the, and the different rooms where they, they make the recordings for these, uh, for the events, um, done and then on the second and third floor they'll have sort of office spaces around the outside of the of the building or on the exterior portion of the of the building and then on the interior portion in the it's sort of a entirely a circular building so in the annular region they'll have this sort of open office um sort of uh, you know sort of this open space atmosphere so this really allowed for a lot more collaboration by people uh, you know so all the mathematicians that were there would be able to go out and you know do problems out on the whiteboard and just talk to people, grab a coffee, you know, whatever it is. Yeah, that's that's got to be one of the best places to to learn about blockchain early on. I mean, especially in the mathematics area and just Berkeley in general. It's just it's a really cool place. I visited there. Yeah. So yeah. So I mean, uh, unfortunately, I was not necessarily doing blockchain um, in Berkeley. That was just more of like my own side, you know, interest, right? Um, but they, I think recently the Simons Institute did a, a thematic programs um, on blockchain and distributed applications and, and things related to the entire space. Um, I think that was like uh, either one or two years ago. So it was fairly recent that they, they put on this program. Okay. Yeah. I've always wondered how it's being embraced in, in the universities because I've been out, you know, over 10 years now. I mean, as far as that has been concerned, it has, you know, created this resurgence of interest in, in uh, distributed systems, right? So, you know, broadly, you know, how you can think about it was, you know, we have databases, distributed databases, and, and this whole notion of a distributed network. And the, the problem that you're trying to solve is how do you get agreement on what the state of a database is or the state of the, the you know, essentially what is the, the actual um, state of a, of a machine uh, or what you would call a von Neumann machine. And you want to know how is it being updated over time, right? So everybody has sort of a local copy, but now you have communication channels between different servers, between different nodes, and you want to be able to guarantee that, the updates are in some way synchronized where if somebody is going to be performing an update on node, you know, 4,378, right. That's going to get propagated to the rest of the network. And everybody agrees that this is a valid, uh, you know, transaction or a valid state transition. And so this is a problem that's been, you know, well studied, um, since the late 70s, um, as early as, well, essentially, I think, uh, 77 or 78. And the original problem was posed as how to, how to, I think it was actually a, it's not, it wasn't actually the Byzantine general's problem. It was not described in that way, but it, it's essentially the same. It was actually posed as how to pull off a jewelry heist where you have different groups that are, you know, coordinating their, the, uh, the theft, and they need to communicate to each other when to go ahead and, you know, go into the bank vault or, or what have you to, to steal some jewels. But, it, but it essentially the, 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 the problem statement is the same, right? You want to have agreement amongst a bunch of different parties that may be malicious, and you want to be able to guarantee that as long as there's some, you know, threshold of, of honest actors or, or, or what have you inside of this, this uh, distributed system, you can be guaranteed that the, the result will be valid and that you're all in agreement regarding what is the, you know, the state of, say, a particular bit. So if you think of a bit as a zero or one and you want to be able to know, do we actually go ahead and, you know, go ahead and an attack in the case of the Byzantine general's problem, you attack the city of Byzantine, or in the case of the original uh, description of the problem, do you go ahead and perform the jewel heist or not? Yeah, we've, we've certainly seen 
a few heists throughout the the brief history of of uh, Bitcoin and and others, um, but uh, not really of uh, reflection of the actual code, but more practices of exchanges and and how people manage their uh, you know their wallets and keys and that. Yeah, I think um, the Mount Gox creditors are getting close to some type of resolution. Wow, that's been a long time. I know, right? I, I mean, I wasn't I wasn't a part of, of of Mount Gox, but I I have some friends who are still waiting on their claims. That's a big one. We had that we had the the first first DAO with uh, Ethereum it caused it to fork. Um, there's been you know a few this year even a lot of the news outlets are quick to point out those hacks, but uh, you know they kind of fail to mention the legacy banking system and how much money is is uh, stolen, lost, charged in fees, and I, I would guess that it greatly outnumbers the, the hiccups that crypto has seen in its infancy. Yeah, it's hard to put a, a number on the cost of the legacy system, right? So if you, you know, take all of the data centers that every bank has to use and the the security protocols that they're they're employing and then the the personnel costs and and all this and then you look at how much that actually costs and and you you know really want to dive deep into is this really an efficient solution i i mean i i think i think it's clear that it, it's you know with with most things and um, with most industries what happens is that you you know, over time, the the industry just sort of keeps on adding on to itself, right? And and it, it creates you know different components, and sometimes these components might might be from a startup, where, you know, which is you know quite useful because then you can replace that, you know inefficiencies with a, a more efficient and lean lean solution that a startup might might have created. Um, but then that gets amalgamated and put together into this, this, these uh, giant behemoths and these Leviathan um, entities. But even if you just consider just the banking system overall, you have, you know, a, a, at least from a technology perspective, just so, you know, just putting it all together, um, you know, you had these existing financial instruments long before we had computers, long before we had, um, you know, like stock trading. I mean, you know, like the 1929 crash, right? This, we didn't have computers back then, right? So th- there's there's this entire history of, you know, this uh, you know, financial innovation, but even the the innovation and the improvements that we have made you know, they were done at the time, um, you know, they probably were the best solutions, at least at the time. But now the question has become if they're, you know, 30 year old tech stacks, at some point, you need to upgrade and and make improvements. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, there's a lot we could get into there. But perhaps we should uh, give a little background on Al of Zero and after your college years, uh, maybe bring us up to speed into the the founding there. Sure. So what, what happened here was, you know, after I, I finished up my postdoctoral work, uh, I did some other postdocs. After I did the one with si- at the Simon Institute, I, I sort of jumped around for a bit. Eventually, I landed at IBM and was working at this uh, one of the national labs here in the States at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, um, which is just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. And at the time, they were they had just gotten the, you know, one of these uh, contracts from the government to build out a new supercomputer. So I was just part of the the IBM team um, that was helping to serve the lab scientists on improving their code bases for different scientific applications to to migrate them to this new. Uh, this, you know, this new system to be able to do better high performance computing. Um, So this was a joint contract between IBM and NVIDIA. And I think at the time, um, after, after it was eventually delivered, it was the, the fastest supercomputer in the world. So what happened was this was sort of in 2016 to the end of 2017. And 
I, you know, did everything in the, the ICO era um, or, you know, as much as I could given the U.S. nexus. And then um, eventually got to the point where I was dissatisfied with what I was doing at IBM um, and wanted to do blockchain full time. Around that same time, I was introduced uh, to, to some of the co-founders at Aleph, um, you know, in, in early 2018. And so then the, the idea here is we just sort of, you know, hit it off and, and we're talking about what are, you know, sort of the fundamental problems within the space from a, you know, purely from a scientific perspective and how can we translate this into a, a new layer one and a new project that is trying to address these, these issues from a uh, perspective that builds everything from first principles, from the actual underlying notion that you understand where the security models are coming from, where you understand the, the cryptographic primitives, and how can you use this to build out a, a, new, a new system, but then also at the same time, educate the, the space. So, I mean, what, what had happened was I, you know, was, was doing investments and, and trading and so on, but at, but at some point it was just not as fulfilling in the sense that while I was making money and I was good at trading and, and everything, I had more to offer to the space. And so then in, in some ways, this was my way of, of giving back to, to kind of help um, improve what was being done. You know, because I had a, you know, a lot of, you know, different knowledge from my, from my own time for doing research and everything. Um, so the, the idea here was just more, how can we just go ahead and identify what are the core problems of the space, innovate on the latest research, but then in, in some way, make it our own and improve upon it and sort of add to the, the, uh, the body of knowledge. Yeah, that's impressive. I, I wish I could have been a fly on the wall in that meeting because I always wonder how how these uh, blockchains and companies get started. I mean, I mean, where do you, where do you start uh, other than, uh, you know, identifying problems and solutions when, when it comes time to building a team and, you know, deciding the, the different cryptography you're going to use, maybe just kind of walk me through, you know, just the early days of, of starting the company. Yeah. So uh, technically we're, we don't necessarily have out of zero in and of itself is not a, a company. And this is, we, we kind of hit on this in the, the intro. So out of zero is, is officially a nonprofit foundation um, based out of Switzerland. So it's, it's more akin to the Ethereum foundation or um, the interchain foundation, which is, uh, is uh, uh, done by, by Cosmos and, you know, any of these others. But broadly, where this model came from is, um, is more open source software foundations. So if you look at, you know, the Mozilla Foundation or, or the Rust Foundation or some, you know, any of these others, in, in a lot of ways, what you, what you have is the core IP, the core um, software is actually managed by a independent nonprofit. And then um, what you do is you have several, you have other companies that will want to support the development of that software. Um, and this is, this is sort of the, the I, I mean, I guess the way to think about it is that this model was, was uh, sort of adopted by Vitalik with Ethereum um, and then used to bootstrap funding to, for the development of these, these blockchain ecosystems. And, and that's how you can, you know, in a lot of ways, think about it. Okay, yeah, that's helpful because when I think about how these, um, you know, nonprofits work, it's a little bit vague. So that, that does give me some good insight. Thank you for that. But then as, as far as backing back up to your, to your question on how do you, you know, where do you start? How do you build out a team? What we do is there is a separate for-profit entity that does the software development. So fundamentally, you know, the foundation has service providers that are, you know, actually, you know, writing the, the software and the, and the code. And then, you know, via, you know, your standard legal contracts and, and everything like that, the actual ownership and the IP is then held by the foundation itself. But then the, the, the idea here is whenever it came to how do we, we go ahead and create this, uh, you know, as a starting point, you know, like I said, we, we just sort of start with, you know, first principles. So, in any distributed system, the, the beginning uh, starting point is always consensus. 
So this is the big, you know, how do you solve the Byzantine generals problem? And at the time we were looking at several, there were several solutions that were being offered and, and uh, you know, different models that were being proposed. And, and for the most part, what you, what you were seeing is, or was at the, you know, not is what, what you were seeing. And I think is what we see now is this um, direction of a, a type of hybrid a consensus model where you take a classical permissioned algorithm. So, you know, some, you know, distributed uh, systems uh, solution for, for the Byzantine generals problem and add in some type of anti-civil mechanism to make it into a permissionless, uh, a permissionless platform. And this was being done by, by Cosmos, by Tezos, by, um, you know, a whole slew of, of different projects. But what you, what you have is, is essentially a pool of um, potential validators that are elected for some period of time to run a classical consensus protocol. So classical consensus, as I said, is, is something that we've essentially have solved for the last you know, within the last four decades. Um, and there's, you know, like a very rich history uh, within distributed systems that deal with consensus and complexity theory, either for communication or for um, transaction latency. And what you what you have, though, is the, the biggest problem in, in a public network is how do you transform this sort of paradigm of a permission network or, or essentially a private consortium chain um, you know, based off of say proof of authority, if we want to use the terminology that you know probably a lot of your listeners are, are used to, how do you transform that into a public and permissionless platform? And the way that this is done is this committee has to come from a potential uh, set of people that are you know that that can join that committee in some permissionless way. So in Bitcoin. As an example, let me just maybe let's, let's take a, back, a step back and, and understand the model with whenever it comes to Bitcoin. So with Bitcoin, you're using proof of work and you're trying to solve the puzzle hash. So and what what happens is that if you're a node that solves the puzzle hash, if you're a miner that's, that can find a particular hash that has so many leading zeros, depending on the, the difficulty factor, you are given the authority to write a block, right? So you can go ahead and you know by 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 doing this you get to append the blockchain and then as long as things are are nice and valid and you're not you know you didn't submit a an invalid block the the idea is that other honest nodes other honest miners will have enough time to see that you submitted a block and will go ahead and build a new block on top of the block that you submitted so what's happening here is that the hash power is your anti-civil mechanism, meaning that you need to have some type of scarce resource. In this case, it's computing uh, computing power that allows for um, no way for you to know the the identity of the various actors involved. Uh, so, so, so the problem that you're trying to you know the the, the problem that you're really trying to solve here is this notion of uh, a civil attack. So civil is this attacker who can create as many identities as she wants for free or for low, low to no cost. And the, the idea here is that if she can create enough identities in a permissionless platform, one that you don't necessarily know who are the nodes on this network, you just know there, you know, somebody just says, I'm going to spin up a node. I have this particular IP address and I'm going to, you know, I, I want to participate in this network and approve transactions and add and append to this blockchain. The problem with something like this without some type of a uh, work scheme involved is that anybody around the world, a malicious actor could go ahead and create identities for free and take over the network. And, and essentially build a competing blockchain that is longer than what everybody else has. And in doing so, attack the network and be malicious. So the way that you solve this is by using proof of work. 
Um, so you have to make it so that the people who are part participating in these, in these networks have to have some type of skin in the game. And in this case, the skin of the game is buying, you know, mining hardware and running a, a node and solving these, these uh, proof of work puzzle hashes. Now, this is this can, you know, broadly speaking, you can take this this uh, this notion for for these, uh, um, you know, using, you know, proof of work and uh, trying to 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 solve this uh, this, you know, civil attack. You can you can use anything. You could use you know proof of capacity where it's now hard drive space. You could do proof of stake, which now is just saying that you control some portion of the network. You own some some scarce resource. In this case, a coin. Um, and so it it doesn't really matter what that scarce resource is. You just need to have something, right? And what you're trying to do now is say, okay. Once we have some, once we have the scarce resource, we want to be able to say that the election to this permissioned committee, this committee that is running the classical consensus algorithm, is based off of that scarce resource. And in some ways, this is uh, this is essentially what a lot of these models were going for. So you have, say, a hundred different validators that can be elected for like say a five minute period, they run a classic Byzantine fault tolerant protocol like PBFT or, or which essentially Tendermint as an example would be a variant of PBFT. Um, and they just run this for a short period of time. And after the end, they, you know, the, there's a new election and new nodes are, are chosen. But the entire time what's happening is that the election is, is uh, is being pulled from a pool of potential validators. And that pool of potential validators is that permissionless uh, pool where, where people can join the network or leave the network at any time. They know the rules as to how they can participate. And the way that they can join is based off of this scarce resource, whether it's proof of work or proof of stake or proof of capacity. Um, and, you know, in the end, in a lot of sense, it doesn't really matter. So. I know this was a long, long explanation, but what, you know, so what you have to, you know, what you have to realize is these, uh, the, the model that you're trying to accomplish is a permissionless system. And so what you can do though, is you can take any classic Byzantine fault tolerant algorithm out there and then slap on some anti-civil resistant mechanism up front and essentially get a permissionless platform from that. So now the, 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 the problem then becomes um, not what is your, your civil resistance scheme, but it becomes how good of, uh, of a consensus protocol do you have that's operating this in this short period of time. And if you can sort of identify the bottlenecks there and improve upon that, then um, you can be you know, pretty efficient. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. I um, really appreciate you taking the time to explain that because you hit on well many many good areas there early days we would hear a lot about scalability that, that was a big topic and it seems like not only are you tackling that you're also tackling privacy security cost and and speed because i, I know you know bitcoin is notoriously slow um for for most people they're used to uh you know banks taking sometimes a business day or if it's on a friday you got to wait till monday so they may you know they might kind of laugh at at us debating you know a, a few minutes or up to 10 minutes for a bitcoin transaction but then when you scale it up to the whole world or everybody starts clogging up that system it it could slow down considerably so definitely interested to hear how you're approaching some of those challenges. Um, yeah. So, so the way, the way to think about it is you have a, this distributed system has um, it's like with any operating system you have, you have your windows machine, you have your Mac, you have your, your Linux or maybe you're running or whatever Unix variant that you have. Uh, maybe you're running Ubuntu or Gentoo. It doesn't really matter, but there's a state to your operating system. And 
the way to think about it now is that in these distributed networks, the state is now, you know, sort of, you know, a global state that everybody is agreeing on, but it's like a, a global operating system. So everybody has this ability of updating this, this, uh, this operating system with transactions. And these transactions are ways that you can, you know, write a file, you can, you know, change the underlying state. And this is sort of the, the model that we find ourselves in. And so now the question then becomes, how do you do this in, a, in an efficient manner? And the, the way that we approach it with, with Alice Zero and our, our consensus protocol is that we use a, a directed acyclic graph as, the, as sort of a intermediary uh, our, you know, sort of data structure. And then eventually we, we end up with a agreement on the order of the transactions in, in a way where you don't have to communicate to a central leader. You don't have to uh, propose, you know, uh, you know, different validators don't have to necessarily propose a particular order. All they have to do is submit some uh, a, like a block of transactions to the network and some other small small amounts of, uh, of information. And in doing so, just by having this information locally, the idea is that the, the nodes are able to agree on the, this end order without necessarily computing it. So as long as they are, or not necessarily computing it, uh, without necessarily uh, communicating um, additional information. So as long as you're gonna be an honest actor, you're able to, you know, have this local structure, this local information, and all honest actors are going to get the same resulting set of transactions that they need to apply, um, you know, for, for this uh, uh, to, to update the underlying state machine in the same way. So what I, what I mean here is that each of these blocks that you're submitting whenever you're doing a transaction to, to some of these, these networks, you're updating the underlying state these are these transactions are essentially state transitions of what is called a finite state, state machine. And the, the issue here is that you have to be able to do this in a sequential fashion. So everybody has to agree on the order in which you're going to make these updates. And the updates can't be really done in parallel. It, 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 there's some, you know, some things that can be problematic if you have dependencies. Um, if you have, say, a program over here, say program A depends on some result of program B or depends on some state variable of program B. And then you have program C that might be updating program B while program A is also trying to read a particular variable. And this, this can be problematic. So, so the, the, the reason here is that you, now you have to, as a, as a general principle is, is you just have to do everything as sequential as possible, or at least remove anything that might have some type of time ordering dependencies. Um, and what, what now happens is how we approach this, this problem is we want to be able to go ahead and make, you know, have agreement on what these state transitions are in as fast as way as possible. Um, where the computation is, is sort of minimal, the communication structure is minimal, um, you're not having to send out a lot of duplicate details or things that could be readily derived from pre-existing information. And this is actually evident from the, the, uh, the consensus protocol itself, which we, we were able to get peer reviewed at a conference that the ACM put together back in 2019. And we're able to get it and, and actually prove and show that the communication complexity is, uh, is optimal, as well as the transaction latency, uh, the time to finality, and how quickly we can guarantee that a decision is made regarding whether or not a, a bid is a zero or one it is fast is, is also optimal as well. This has been really enlightening, and I definitely would love to have you come back on sometime. I, I know we didn't um, talk a whole lot about you know some of the the main net launches at Al of zero uh the native token but uh real quickly i mean if there's anything that uh 
you want to leave us with uh, where, where people can go to learn more, uh, potentially get involved um, in any way, um, please please feel free. Yeah, absolutely. So the probably the best uh, you know location would be to go to our website at alephzero.org. Um, and then you can also follow us on Twitter. Um, the Twitter handle is Aleph double underscore zero, um, zero all the way spelled out. And then we have uh, Telegram as well as Discord communities, which you can follow by um, checking out the leaks on our, on our main webpage. And then as far as other, other details, yeah, our, our main net is, is, uh, is slated here for you know, for, for the, uh, you know, early November, um, we're just finalizing some backend infrastructure currently. And right now our testnet is up and running. So you, if you, if you want, you can check out the, the testnet at testwallet.alofzero.org. Uh, um, and you can play around with it and, and see how fast we're able to get transactions and, and have a, um, a finality between moving funds around between different accounts. Um, other, other than that, you know, absolutely happy to, to come back and, and discuss more. I know this was, you know, maybe a little bit more technical than I was wanting to, to talk about too, but, you know, at, at some point it's a bit of an education uh, campaign as well to kind of get people on the same page to understand what these technologies are and, and what they're really doing and how to think about them. Yeah, Absolutely. Totally agree. And Matthew, it was a real pleasure talking with you today. I just want to thank you again for your time and uh, I look forward to speaking with you again soon. Yeah, you too, Ethan. Thanks. 